My name is Mia Taylor. I am a senior theater major, and today I'll be presenting a 10 minute documentary of the making of the mother effer with the hat. Um, and I'll be speaking briefly afterwards and take and I'll take any questions. Thank you. All right, quiet on the set. Are we rolling? Um, Are we recording? Recording. Lovely. All right. Hi, I'm Mia Taylor, and I present to you Mother with the Hat. Ray Samantha Panero. I use a they, them, and he, him pronouns. And I am a junior a theater major with a dual minor in psychology and film. And I play cousin Julio in Mother and I'm also occasionally a PA. So yeah. What's up? My name is Caleb Smith. I'm a junior here where I'm a theater and film double major and I have the opportunity to play Ralph and motherfucker with that. Hi, my name is Mia Taylor. I'm a senior theater major and film minor, and I'm the director of Motherfucker with the Hat, which is my last senior show. I chose Motherfucker with the Hat a very long time ago, actually a year ago. I first read it for directing one class with Matt Huff, and I instantly fell in love with these characters. These are some crazy characters, however, I can see their humanity and I just love the balance of the good and bad. And so I really just wanted to tell complex stories of humanity. Like no matter how bad someone may be, there will always be a balance to who they are in goodness. This, okay, this was very interesting because I've done film before and I was very curious to see what it looked like in a pandemic and um, as, as you will see our director decided to put the production in a format where we're not neglecting that we're in a pandemic so we'll be wearing masks throughout the film and that was very interesting during the rehearsal and the filming process because it felt like we had to find new ways to bring these characters to life behind masks. So it came down to my decision um, due to safety and health, I just wanted everyone to feel comfortable, including myself. And so that led me to choosing, we're going to just do a film, where we will make sure everyone has, uh, that is negative positive, to come on set. And thus far, we've been pretty good at that. We have, we've been great. We've been able to stay on the clock. With the if someone has COVID right now, we're in a part where we're having to halt uh, shooting because of COVID scares. And so that's been very interesting to deal with. Um, you know, this experience has been really, really amazing, not only to get the film work, but also to work with fellow students and like to really like kind of get into the, what it feels like to make a film when no one knows what they're doing, which I feel like is good because then we can all learn together. And yeah, this year has just been a learning experience and a growing experience and it all sucks. It sucks. Everything is online. Really, I chose these actors, uh, specifically Mark Collins for Jackie, Cece Campbell for Veronica, and Caleb Smith for um, Ralph D. I chose these three actors because they could handle any direction that I gave, no matter how small or how big. I chose to audition for this role because I just read the script and I really connected to the um, the crazy cyclical nature of each character they are very um they're very uh, their addiction is is very prominent and i connected with that with my uh, family um history and i really connected with wanting to tell this story of not just from the from the lens of addiction but from the lens of what goes on behind addiction 
um, you have the family nature of it, you have the relationship nature of it, and it's just the theme really stuck out to me. There's that have things going for them, um, just like Jackie and how Jackie could really actually turn his life around, but he's being misguided and misdirected by the character of Rob. We see that he likes to manipulate and tear down in like a really non-judgmental um, or, or rude or mean way. It's almost like he's just blunt, like he's just very straightforward. My favorite scene to shoot was um, scene Seven, which was the first scene that I shot, and it's just me and Mark, and it's, I liked it because I feel like that's when a lot of, like when I really tell him genuinely how I feel about him, and we have like a really good one-to-one, -one. and it's, it's a really good feeling to like have that with an actor, like I feel like we really connected during the scene. I think Veronica throughout the entirety of this production has a really big um, self-realization, she realizes she can't stay in the place that she's in. Um, that means changing her life entirely, going with different people, and like really sort of having a uh, coming to reality moment for herself where she she evolves into this new person and she, she wants to seek change and we may not be able to track that through the entirety of the film because it does follow other stories, but I think you definitely see her growth and it definitely started. Um. Honestly, I just love working with Alex Ray, my fight choreographer. And I mean, we just have a great relationship. I can always talk to him, he can always talk to me, we can always resolve conflicts with anything, to be honest. And I just, it's so fascinating, honestly. I thought it was a really nice experience. I love that Alex was there to be, um, to help us and guide us through the process, even when we were filming, make, making sure that we're both okay. I know he worked with, um, me a lot, making sure my body was right and making sure that I was feeling good. The same goes for Mark. And I think that um, taking that and translating it to film is such a cool experience and being able to take baby steps and make all of the small movements we practice and we learn with him um, come to life through the performance. Um, I would have to say that the director and the person that put this on, Mia, uh, has really done a, a great job in being like, um, organizational, um, uh, making sure that everybody's on track, the times are set. Um, if there needs to be a time, even at the last minute change, she has like a backup, uh, a plan B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, everything. She's got a plan for everything. It was, it was great to have this opportunity to learn what it's like to perform in front of an audience that lies behind a camera. And that's an audience that's endless, right? In, in the theater, we get to see, we have an idea of the capacity, but the capacity is endless in a camera. So. When I graduate, I'm, I will attend the University of Southern Mississippi with a, for an MFA of theater directing. I'm super excited. I'm a little bit nervous since I'm, I'm, I haven't been directing very long, but I'm not worried. Um, I'm pretty excited. John Nooner um, is an alum, so is uh, Jax Wright, who is also an Oglethorpe alum, uh, is attending there right now. So I'm very excited. Um, I just wonder what I'm going to do. I'm sure it'll work out. <laughs> but yeah, I'm so thankful with, for my education here. I just wouldn't have done it without so many staff and faculty members in and outside of the theater. I just, I'm super thankful. And I'm also thankful for my cast and crew for always being on point. I mean, we're students and every time we're on set, we're in rehearsal, we always grow a little bit and a little bit more. And we all recognize this. And it's just nice knowing that we're all growing. We're all getting it slowly together. And we fall together and we rise up together. And I'm super, super thankful for everyone in this project. And. I can't wait to show it to the world. Thank you guys and have a good day. So yes, uh, this semester has been very interesting um, to prepare for a lot of rehearsals, 
a lot of filming. I really had to have a lot of conversations with a lot of different people just for the safety and just making sure everyone's healthy because I, ugh, the idea of people being sick because of this is frightening. But I had to have conversations in the fall just to make this possible. Um, one of the biggest issues that I had coming into the spring was where am I going to film? Um, so I have to talk to Blake Petty, I had to talk to Eli Arnold, and basically officials who can give me answers right then and there and just help me. I quickly realized that filming in residence halls is just not an option. It's just not. Mm -mm, mm -mm. So because of that, I decided to utilize the library and the theater and through collaboration with Matt Huff and Eli Arnold, I've been able to film uh, not freely as I want, but effectively as I want. And thankfully, my cast and crew have been has been very, very diligent with their health and safety. We always uh, come into set making sure we're all COVID negative. Often we actually go get COVID tested together, which has been nice, um, you know, knowing that we have 20 odd people to always rely on. Um, another thing that was a little bit difficult during this process was the fact that since the film department was remote, I had to rely on my family and my peers a lot for equipment. Um, my dad was gracious enough to buy at least $600 worth of equipment for me that I will be using in grad school, thankfully. But a lot of the other things that I really needed, like cameras and sometimes lights, um, would often come from the students in the production. It, it's their own materials. So this production, I've learned that I, we all really need to work together for this to happen. I know I'm the director, but this is not only my project. This is everyone's project. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for being here. I'll be happy to take any questions. How proud are you of yourself and the entire cast and crew? How proud? Yes, because y'all should be so proud. Everything looks so great. Yes, thank you. If I could hug them, I would hug them, but I can't hug them. So mm, I'm very proud of everybody. Mia, what, what, what is your process in the editing of this? Are you editing as well, along with the other uh, cinematographers? So we actually have a team of editors um, who have been in this process fairly early on. I am not editing myself because that's just not my forte. However, with this group of, I wanna say six editors, they often give me what they have. I'll give diligent notes give it back and we'll just go through that cycle endlessly until we're all satisfied. Great job, Mia. Can you tell us about something you're taking away from this that's gonna make you a better director? Yes, I can. Um, so off the bat, I did not realize the, I did not, really truly realize the effect that I have on every department. Obviously, yes, I in the rehearsal hall with actors. However, in the meantime, my presence is also needed in, in those editing conversations. I'm also needed to schedule the rest of the week for rehearsals or design meetings. I realize that I'm also needed in a scenic, a like building up the set. So we always have to go to every scene before shooting, fix it up the way that we'd like, conduct the bed, uh, make sure we put the plants how we want it, this, that, and the other. So I didn't really realize how much I was actually needed on the spot. So long story short, I now understand the multitude of, my, of, a, of the role of the director for sure. Thank 
there are no further questions, thank you very much for attending. Thank you, Mia. That was fantastic. Okay, so Rowan, we're going to hear from Rowan next. So, uh, my name is Rowan Joyna. I am a freshman at Oglethorpe. I, I've been working with Jamie Lester uh, to perform observations on the RLI race star YZ Capricorni. I, now, I know this is mostly a talk about uh, literature, and it will be for the most part. So, going into a hard science like uh, astronomy uh, might cause a little bit of whiplash, so I'm going to do my best to explain things as they come. I uh, try to bring things down into terms where everybody's on the same page. Uh, so an overview, I'm uh, going to get an overview of the project and an introduction into our LIRA stars themselves. Our star, YZ Capricorn, I have a YZ Cap as an R LIRA star. The observations that we had, the methods that we had to go through to get those observations, and finally the conclusions that we came to. So uh, we are working with an organization called Our Solar Siblings, which provides resources for undergraduate research. Uh, through Oberhof University, obviously. Um, we are comparing pre-existing Gaia satellite RLI ray data to terrestrially gathered experimental data. So uh, Gaia was a satellite sent out a multitude of years ago that would actively uh, go out into our solar system and gather data on distant stars. And our uh, research is basically proving that we can do the same thing from Earth with very similar accuracy. Our, our work began September 20th, 2020, and this is the culmination of that work. So, starting, uh, what is a star? More so the bottom one than the top one. Uh, it's basically going to just be a giant ball of space gunk. Uh, if it's dust, other debris, uh, that's under huge gravitational forces, uh, eventually causing nuclear fission. That nuclear fission creates immense amount of lights and immense amount of heat, uh, which creates the stars that we're aware of uh, in our night sky. Uh, stars have a variety of different qualities, including luminosity, metallicity, uh, and magnitudes, all of which I don't expect you to know off the top of your head, but I will do my best to explain this again. So people have been looking up into the night sky for a very, very long time, as I'm sure you can imagine. Uh, some people started to notice that some stars were changing over a period of time. Uh, for example, Euloporus was first discovered in 1890 by Jacobus Cornelius Captain. Uh, it was the first R. Lyrae uh, star that was confirmed to be an R. Lyrae star. R. Lyrae itself was discovered in 1899 by Wilhelmina Flynn. Uh, these stars will literally grow and shrink and increase and decrease in magnitude over a period of time. They'll have lower metallicity and shorter periods than other variable stars that change in magnitude and size over time. So at the bottom right there, you can see a diagram of how our Lyra stars will actually seem to work, where when they're cooler, they'll be larger and redder. When they're hotter, they'll be smaller and bluer. So lots more basic information, or sort of background information. Uh, our Lyra stars themselves are periodic variable stars, meaning that their magnitude changes over a pretty consistent period. Uh, they are used as standard candles, which has a lot of implications in astronomy. Uh, standard candles are used to measure extragalactic distances. Uh, so if you look at an RLI star using pre-existing uh, relationships that we know about the star and its magnitude, we're able to determine the distance of that star from Earth. Uh, they're often used to determine the distance of globular clusters from Earth. Uh, and this is due to a really consistent, like I mentioned, period luminosity relation. Uh, we're able to look at the star and say, this is the period, this is how bright and dim it gets, this is how far away it is. Uh, on the right, we have a couple of examples of how our Lyra stars can pulsate. Uh, our AB stars will have a really sharp increase in magnitude over a really short period of time, as you see on the bottom, and then slowly decrease into a lower magnitude, where our C stars will have a really sinusoidal uh, pulsation. So this uh, y axis is going to be how bright the star is, the x axis being the period of time over which it pulsates. So, finally, getting into our star, YZ Cap. Uh, YZ Cap is an RRC star, meaning that it has that sinusoidal uh, pulsation. 
Uh, we picked it as an object of study because it was visible near constantly in the, from the observatories that we wanted to observe it from. And it was present in a variety of astronomical surveys like SkyMapper, SDSS, PanStars, and APAS, which are a lot of acronyms that are basically just a bunch of groups of data collected about various stars. So to observe the star itself, uh, we utilize the Las Cumbres Observatory, which has a variety of uh, observatories all over the world. Uh, for example, on the bottom right here, we have the four meter uh, telescope used in Haleakala uh, Observatory in Hawaii. Um, our official observations were taken in four filters, the B filter, V filter, and the SDSS's IP and ZS filters. Uh, observations were taken from October 19th to November 1st, 2020. At the bottom left, we actually have an inverse color uh, picture of the star itself that was gathered by the observatory. This is the uh, sort of things that we use to make our observations. So again, even more background before we can get into the actual methods. Uh, to analyze pictures of the star, a lot has to go into it. So we utilized photometry methods, uh, which will analyze the stars for us and get a lot of information really quickly. There are two primary types of photometry methods, aperture and point spread function. Uh, the top right here is aperture, where the program will put a literal aperture around the picture of the star and count the magnitude of the star in that circle. Works really well for pictures of really regularly shaped stars, really circular stars. Uh, where a point spread function will draw multiple lines across a star and gather the magnitude, the change in magnitude across that line. Works really well for pictures of stars that are more oblong or more regularly shaped. Uh, in our case, uh, our library was very regular in its shape, so we were able to use the aperture photography method. So the pictures that we got from LCL, the observatory, were sent through our solar siblings pipeline which would generate these plot files uh, that would help us analyze the stars themselves. Uh, we sorted through all of our files, 194 in total. Uh, 70 weren't kept due to maybe blurry image quality. We just couldn't refine them to the point that they could be analyzed. Uh, so we ended up with 124. We ran them through a program called AstroSource, which was created by, uh, again, our silly siblings, uh, in order to analyze these stars a lot more quickly. Uh, we eventually choose the .sex photometry method as it created the most consistent results with the smallest amount of error. So here we have the actual light produced by our star. Uh, each of these dots on each of these charts are one image, uh, one, one of multiple images of the star. Uh, AstroSource analyzes them and places them on this chart based on magnitude in that image. So we have as time goes on, it might increase slowly, and then decrease, decrease, and go back to increasing. Uh, all of these charts represent different filters. So again, the A, B, B, and ZS filters. Uh, and they all confirm that RLRA is an RFC star because it has that very sinusoidal uh, pulsation. So finally, getting into some data analysis. Uh, the phase dispersion minim minimization method was used for calculating the period of the star. Uh, it both there were two primary methods for determining uh, the period of the star. Both of ours were just about identical, so we eventually just went with PDM for simplicity. Uh, on the right, we see that all four of our filters generally agree on the period of the star with some variation in the error, uh, but generally it can be agreed that the period of the star is 0.274 days. So over 0.274 days, it will go all the way from increasing to decreasing back to the starting point. Uh, Fe over H and log Z are both different representations of metallicity, which is basically how metal dense the star is compared to non-metals in the star. Uh, and E, B minus V is a representation of the redness that the light traveling from the star to us will experience. So a change in the frequency of that light as it travels. So all of our research is based on the Catalan equations. Uh, we gather these data from the stars and put them through the Catalan equations to find the absolute magnitude of the stars, the 
brightness for, uh, just about directly in front of the star. Uh, so you'll see in the 2004 equation, we're using log z, which is a representation of metallicity, to determine the magnitude, the magnitude in the V filter, uh, and using log p, or log of the period, and log z, uh, to determine the magnitude in the i and z filters. On the bottom right here is the equation that we use to determine the distance of the star exactly. So the lowercase m is the apparent magnitude, or how we see the light of the star from Earth. Uh, so both of these are just about the same equations. You'll get d equals 10 to the m minus m plus 5 over 5. Uh, basically, we're using the apparent magnitude as observed from Earth and the absolute magnitude as gathered from the Catalan equations to find the distance of, from the star to us. So we finally have our data analysis. Uh, on the bottom right here, you'll see all of the individual values for the magnitudes in the various filters that we get, uh, the V, I, and Z filters. Plug them into these equations on the left to determine the distances for, again, the V, I, Z filters. And you can see that compared to the V, I, Z filters, the Gaia numbers for the satellite uh, is very similar. Uh, there are some outliers in terms of the error bars on our I and Z filters being a little substantial. Uh, for reference, all of these are in parsecs. Uh, and a single parsec is 3.26 light years. So these stars are very far away uh, once, once you really put that into perspective. So in conclusion, the experimental period of 0 0.02, 0 0.273 days uh, matches the prior gathered information about on the level. The experimental data values for the distance match the prior gathered uh, Gaia data. And as such, the distance of an RLIRA star can accurately be determined. I would be happy to take questions. So Rowan, if you end your screen share, then we'll be able to see everybody, um, which might make Q&A a little easier. Thank you. Well, I'll ask a question. So Rowan, you're in your first year at Oglethorpe, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So that's some really, um, some impressive work to be doing as a freshman. Um, so what do you see potentially doing next? It seems like you'll be able to do a lot of good research for your year. Uh, well, all fairness, uh, my first semester, I was a physics major and decided that there was a whole lot of math involved, currently a politics major. Um, but there's this experience has been so like strange to where a lot of the time you'll see, like in, in previous physics classes, you'll just see like your teacher going, hey, figure out how fast this ball is going to be traveling when you drop it off the table. Uh, and so going from that physics, that like elementary level of physics to, hey, let's use observatories and advanced programming to figure out exactly how far away a star is uh, compared to prior data. Um, I'd certainly love to continue doing things in astronomy as long as I can keep up with them all. Um, so I look forward to hopefully a good future. Um, hi. So if I remember correctly, you said that the particular like program that you were doing this through was called Our Solar Siblings, and they were able to provide like research grants. Can you go over the process of what it was like to attain those? So Our Solar Siblings uh, basically set up the primary uh, research. It was all sort of done through them. They actually do a lot of different so right now I'm writing a paper along with my partner, Jamie Lester, uh, that's actually going to be peer reviewed by other OSS members uh, that are part of the program. Uh, it's, there wasn't a lot of work on our side as much as getting our computer done. So it was a, a lot more work on our side of actually using them. Um, but I think most of it was set up in advance. Is there anyone else that wants to follow up with a question? 
Thank you, Rowan. That was a really nice job. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to hear from our third presenter. So, Melissa, you have the floor. All right, thank you. I'll share my screen. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about the representation of women in class in Young and Hungry. I am a senior here at Oglethorpe, so I'll be graduating in a month, can't believe it. But last semester, I took a class called Media, Culture, and Society, which kind of sparked my interest into doing my research on the current show I was watching on Netflix, which was Young and Hungry, and connect it to a few of the readings we had done in class, and then I'll talk about the additional research that I conducted. So a little introduction about the show itself um, and the research I conducted. It's an ABC sitcom, and I identified three main women characters that had qualities where I could distinguish class ideals that society has created and upheld over time. And my analysis, my analysis explored how each of the women in a different class in the, re, is represented in the show. And I specifically only looked at season one because I would have been able to compile a, a ton of different things. So I just focused on the first season and looked at how their attitudes and behaviors compared to real life observations. And my further analysis focused on the representation of women's work and the contradictions between the inclusion of both feminist and post-feminist ideals. So a little bit about the background of the show. It first premiered on ABC Family on June 25th and 2014. It was written by David Holden and produced by Andy Cadiff with executive producers Ashley Tisdale, which is a familiar name probably to most of you guys, uh, Eric and Kim Tenenbaum, and Jessica Rhodes. And so by September of 2014, the show was ordered for a second season. And then on July 25th of 2018, the season finale of the fifth and final season aired and the show was actually canceled and not renewed for a sixth season. Um, it actually ended on a cliffhanger, so if you haven't watched the show, um, I think it was really good overall, but it kind of led you on to kind of make up your own ending. Uh, and then in place of season six, Freeform planned on releasing a TV movie that was in the works, but the movie was canceled, and there was really no explanation from the network or cast. Um, but it was nominated for several awards, the Teen Choice Awards, People Choice Awards, and the intended audience was young women in their teens and early 20s who are part of the working middle class. And as I said before, it's made available to stream on Netflix, and um, the new seasons were aired on Freeform as they came out. So in order to understand kind of where I was, was going to go with my own research of the show, Sorry, there's a train that's going by. Uh, Marta, I live in an apartment by here. But anyways, um, I had to do some research about the class depictions in society itself and also draw on other TV shows that are already out there, such as The Real Housewives of New York City, where wealthy women are portrayed as bad moms who don't really have a lot of self-awareness or have broken friendships. And in the show, the woman could pretty much afford anything money can buy, but the money did not buy genuine relationships with others. And the housewives are conscious of the high ideal of the poised socialite, so upper class being really polite, um, but they're kind of framed as doubly incapable of attaining the ideal or realizing the disparity because it showed them going out a lot or leaving their kids at home to be babysat and things like that. And so that kind of drew upon the upper class individuals, uh, mostly women. And then Gilmore Girls um, looked at the working class women and how they experienced struggles of poverty and approached life with more optimistic outlook, created community with others, but also used characters that are considered classless, which um, is defined in a neoliberalism um, ideal, which expounded on the idea that there's a death of class. So like, as I said, classless. 
So an example of this is Lorelai. She's a middle-aged woman who is the matriarch to her family, but she experiences moments of structural working class poverty. And so I could connect that to the main character, which I'll be talking about later on. And so over my research, I found that typically lower class individuals have more characteristics that are inclined towards compassion and selflessness to build a communal connection with others. But on the contrary, there is evidence in different studies where upper class individuals are more likely to act independently to maintain their own wealth. So there was this study done where a question was asked at the end if people wanted to stay to do a community building exercise. And the majority of people who said yes were lower class individuals. And then in a different study that I looked at, um, there you had to roll the dice and the total would determine if you got a $50 gift card, but you would self-report those numbers. And it found that actually people were more likely to cheat, but the people who cheated you could also give that gift card away to someone else. And so for those that did cheat to get the money, the upper class were more likely to cheat and get the money for themselves versus the lower class that gave the money to somebody else. And so furthermore, I looked at gender and the working class. So if any of you guys have seen I Love Lucy, it portrays the middle class buffoon um, in the form of a woman who's a ditzy blonde and um, making it more about gender or less about gender and more about class because a lot of the times like men back in the day with TV shows were portrayed as the working class buffoon like if you've seen the honeymooners um, but it's men and women that are both depicted as working class buffoons and then uh, I finally looked at the feminism and post-feminism in television. And there were some experiments where researchers identified that 13.9% of the total number of scripts in primetime television shows um, had female courting strategies. And so it, women used passive and alluring strategies to win men's affection and were encouraged to participate in these strategies um, but they were also faced with the challenge that they were the ones responsible for a men's sexual desire, which I'll connect back to Young and Hungry. Um, so with my methodology, as I have discussed, I used text-centered approach um, and only looked at the first season. And so I compared and contrasted the attitudes and behaviors of women in class by looking at the lifestyles and the personalities. And then I analyzed if career aspirations are related to gender, and if so, what the motive was. And then I also identified if there were examples of feminist or post-feminist ideals in Young and Hungry. Okay, so the first character I analyzed was Caroline. She was the fiance to Josh, who's the boss of um, the, this tech company. And she was portrayed as a stuck up wealthy woman and she fit the social standard for what beauty looks like by dressing lavishly and extravagantly. And she also gloat about her material goods a lot and wore jewelry and had a lot of shoes and beauty products. And so in the specific episode called Young and Getting Played, mm -hmm. Uh, she was fixated on maintaining her expensive Im image, so she was not able to recognize this underlying problem of having too much clothing when Josh was in the room with her. And so she did, however, show an inkling of self-awareness when she was able to, to determine that she couldn't part with her clothes because they were the closest thing to family with her to her. So I related this um, to the Real Housewives because she is the person who might have been neglected by uh, her mother and left at home. And so she did uh, grow up with her sitter and kind of relied on these material goods as her close connections. And so she would brag about these goods um, incessantly and she would make remarks to Gabby, who's the main character and the working class woman to feel lower in status. And so she had the lack of self-awareness and sociability that I had researched. And another time she had forgotten Josh's birthday, which was her fiance. And Gabby let Caroline take credit for her personal, personalized and thoughtful gift. 
So it was kind of a display of selfish behavior from Caroline, but selfless behavior from Gabby. Um, and she, Caroline will also act entitled and not hold back when I was watching these episodes and she would be making remarks um, and kind of overstate her powerful status that she had above Gabby. And she also would mention that she quickly tired of other people and admitted her longest friendship lasts about three hours, um, kind of going back to this upper class uh, level of socialness. So the next character I looked at was Yolanda. She's the housekeeper and was portrayed as kind hearted, but she was also not afraid to be straightforward and blunt. And she stood in as the motherly figure in the show, especially when Gabby would get in trouble a lot and find herself into trouble. And she didn't hesitate to give advice or perform selfless deeds in response to other people's suffering. So she's going to be my connection to the lower class individuals that are represented in TV shows. Um, in the episode Young and Ringless, uh, Gabby walked in and left her jacket on the sofa. And Yolanda immediately called her out and said, that her rules are to have the apartment clean because she takes pride in her job. And also, um, even though it's not a very well-respected job, it corresponds to these past adolescent feelings about her well-being. And so I connected that to how, even though these lower class individuals might be in poverty and have to work in lower jobs, they still care about um, their work that they're doing and will take pride in that. And in a different episode, Young and Secret, she's obsessed with getting a skinnier body to feel better about her overall well being and decided to go on a juice diet. But the next evening, she weighed herself to see how many pounds she lost and confessed to Elliot, another character in the show, um, that she reset the scale to weigh 15 pounds less. Um, and so the real reason that she wanted to lose weight was because her ex-husband would be coming into town and she wanted his approval. And so Yolanda was using a female courting strategy, which went back to my research about feminist ideals, um, which implied that her appearance was more important than her personality, which was represented in the show. And um, women do not need to go to extremes of only consuming juice to make a man think that you're sexy, which corresponds to these post-feminist strategies on primetime television that are shown. And finally, Gabby, who's the main character. She's an outgoing, charismatic woman who is the member of the lower middle class. So more like a working class woman because she's a young chef who has dreams of becoming a professional one day. And she was inspired by Julia Child, her idol. Um, and Gabby's also feisty and willing to do whatever it takes to make her dreams come true, which kind of looks into the research that I did about career inspirations. And in the pilot episode, she made a grilled cheese for Josh, which he loves. And all she needed to do was make the perfect dinner for his girlfriend, Caroline. So she was his chef and Josh and Caroline um, were both together. But then Caroline broke up with Josh and the night continued, but it ends with Gabby and Josh in the same bed together. So it kind of portrays Gabby as an irresponsible, yet immature, and not able to control herself, which is um, connected to this working class buffoon that is represented in TV. And the morning after scene shows that Josh is able to forget the whole thing and pick up where his life left off, but Gabby kind of had to cover it up and selflessly keep that to herself, uh, which also connects to these post-feminist ideals and strategies that were represented in TV shows that women used. And so the underlying issue was swept under the rug and not explicitly talked about again. And then in Young and Careless, Gabby overcomes these class struggles by acquiring material goods to show an idea of wealth or receives help from Josh to fix all her problems. So I connected this to Gilmore Girls, how there's a classlessness and in Gilmore Girls, Lorelai had wealthy parents who she didn't associate herself with because she wanted to show that she could support herself and didn't need help. But when Lorelai visited the bank and needed help to borrow a loan, she ended up accepting her mother's help. So this is similar to what's shown in Young and Hungry because Gabby's had a similar relationship with Josh. 
because without even asking, Josh traded in Gabby's car and brought her brand new one when her car was having problems. And so the struggles um, depict the real struggles of what the work, oh, they don't depict the real struggles of what the working class is going through, because that's kind of unrealistic how people could step in and just fix all your problems. And this happens a lot in the show um, because most working class people don't have wealthy family or friends that can instantly get them out of trouble. So in conclusion, um, I found that attitudes and behaviors of how women identify with class compared to societal expectations are based on specific characteristics. And so it aligned with the research I did with what is actually represented in TV shows because upper class individuals were more focused on benefiting themselves due to the, to the lack of awareness, leading to a lack of compassion towards others, whereas lower individual, lower class individuals were represented in ways that um, built community because they did whatever it took to help others. And so in addition, the representation of working class buffoon is less about gender and more about class. So there's a lot of humor that went on in the show and depicted the irresponsible nature of the working class woman. And then neoliberalism showed up in modern television because uh, of the help that Gabby received from Josh. And then I also found that um, contradictions between feminist and post-feminist ideals also arose in the show to exploit the sexuality of women to please men. And in my analysis, I found connections to the real world observations from the representation of women's work in Young and Hungry. So yes, that concludes my presentation. I'll stop sharing my screen. Are there any questions? Okay. <laughs> Thank you guys for attending. That was really nice. Thank you, Melissa. That was a great presentation. So if, if no one has any questions, I guess we'll say thanks everybody for joining us for this session. And thank you so much to our three students who all presented wonderful um, projects and enjoy the rest of the, um, the symposium.